Hello, I'm Howard Chang. I'm a principal with Global Econ, and I'm going to cover diversion ratios in our lecture today. Diversion ratios have become increasingly important in merger review in both the US and in Europe. For a differentiated products merger, when you're looking at unilateral effects, diversion ratios are really important to understand. The good news is that diversion ratios are really pretty easy to understand. So let's, let's start with an example. So suppose I've got product A and it's sold by one of the two merging parties, and product B is sold by the other merging party. And there are other products, C and D and so on, sold by other firms, but A and B are the, the two central products of interest. The thought experiment to keep in mind is, suppose I increase the price of product A by just a little bit. Well, if I increase the price of A, sales of A are going to go down at least a little bit. And let's, let's just make up an example. So suppose the sales of A go down by 100 units. The, the question, the, the definition of the diversion ratio is, of the sales lost by A, what proportion go to B, go to the other product owned by one of the merging parties? So if I lose 100 units of A, and let's say, let's say we know that B goes up by 12 units, that's it. That's your diversion ratio. 12 of 100, 12 of the 100 lost units of A go to B, and that's your diversion ratio, 12 of 100 or 12 percent. It really is that straightforward. And intuitively, you can, you can see that the, the higher the diversion is to B, the more B is important as a competitive constraint on product A. In a merger, you also have to worry about diversion in both directions. So here we've got diversion from A to B, and we've also got to think about diversion from B to A for, for the two products that are covered by, by the merging parties. Once you have your diversion ratio estimate, you can take that along with the estimate of profit margins and assumptions about efficiencies, and that gets you to your upward pricing pressure type tests. And that's covered in a, that's covered in a separate lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to focus on how do we actually go about calculating diversion ratios in practice, and what are some of the things to watch out for. There are really three main ways to, to go about it. And I'm going to start with one lost data or other business records that you might have from the merging parties. So if, if, the, if the firms involved are, run big sales organizations, they tend to have large databases that capture information about about customers, about who, uh, who won sales or who lost sales, and which competitors they won and lost from. If you actually had such a data set, if you had a one lost data set, you could go to it. And suppose, you know, suppose we did that, and we go and we look at product A and see the times when people tried to sell product A and lost out. Let's say there were 100 circumstances of that in 2010. Well, you go and you look at each of those instances and you try to figure out who was the firm that actually won the sale that A lost. And you could just go down the list and see if, if someone reported that B, B gained the sale. And let's say 12 out of 100 times, B gained the sale that A, a lost. Well, that, that's your diversion ratio again. That the 12 of 100, the 12%, that's your diversion ratio that you calculate from one loss data. You may have other business records that shed light either qualitatively or quantitatively on, on this measure, but quantitative data like one loss data, like bidding records and so on, are a straightforward way to estimate diversion. If you're, if you're working in a consumer products industry, you're not going to have one loss type data. And in that case, you can think about going to a consumer survey. Now, as with any survey that you conduct for the purposes of, of a merger proceeding, you've, you've got to worry about survey design, survey reliability, how seriously it's going to be taken by, by the agencies. But one of the advantages for doing diversion through a consumer survey is that the, the question you ask is really pretty straightforward. So how, how would we go about it? Well, you could again go to, to A, start with A, and go find 100 people that bought A within the last three months or so. And you could go and ask them, well, suppose I said you couldn't buy A, that was not an option available to you, what would you have bought instead? Well, they might say I would have bought C, I would have bought B, I, would have, I wouldn't have bought anything. You could, ask, you could ask that question of those 100 people and record their responses. And let's say 12 of them said, yeah, I would have, I would have bought B instead of A. 
Well, again, that gives you a measure of diversion, the 12 over 100 or 12 percent. That's the diversion ratio from a consumer survey. And it has, it has the limitations that all surveys have, but it really is a pretty simple hypothetical question that you're asking them. The third approach I want to mention, just, just for the sake of completeness, is demand estimation. So if you had a really rich data set, if you had lots of data on prices and quantities and so forth, you could estimate a whole set of own price and cross price elasticities between all of the relevant products. So you'd know if the price of A went up a little bit, how much would um, demand for B go up, how much would demand for C go up, and so on. Now, that's, that's a complicated thing to do, and you need, you need a rich data set to do it. If you could do it, that's great. But if you've done that, you've got really all the information that you need to do a full-blown merger simulation analysis. And you, you probably aren't going to do the diversion ratio and upward pricing pressure type approaches. Those are useful in cases where you've got one last data, or you've got business records that shed light on, on diversion ratios, or you can go out and do a consumer survey and the advantage of those is that really they're relatively straightforward to do, and, and they don't involve complicated econometrics. So I want to close with just a, a couple of, of words of warning for, for doing diversion ratio analysis. One thing to worry about is, as with any empirical exercise, what's the reliability of your data? So you've got a great one loss data set, you've calculated diversion ratios, and they're very low. That all sounds great, but you have to worry about how reliable are the, are the entries in the one loss data set? So, for example, um, when, a, when a salesperson records that they lost a sale to, to a given competitor, do they know? Are they guessing? Is there any systematic bias in what they're likely to report? And you've got to worry about those kinds of things intensely. In, in 2010, we worked on the, the Monster Hot Jobs merger. And we spent a lot of time on diversion ratios and a lot of time worrying about these kinds of data quality issues. And one of the things that was, I think, really useful in that case was we found a way to estimate diversion ratios from three different data sets. They were related but largely independent of each other. And so we really had three separate estimates of diversion, and they were, they were pretty consistent with each other. When you're able to present evidence that diversion between the merging parties is low, and that's convincing evidence to the agencies, that, that's really pretty powerful evidence to put forward. And so th you know, that's, that's Diversion Ratio 101, and thank you for, thank you for listening.